thing. He, yeah, he was friends with her roommate, but they didn't know each other, and he lived in the dorm next to us. It's all very strange, but anyway, here you go. Uh, oh, Todd. Thank you, Bruce. Yep. Um, all righty, so, okay. And don't forget, you can also pr uh, purchase DVDs of the talks here um, from Ted, who does a wonderful job for us in recruiting this stuff. Well, so there you go. Um, and without further ado, uh, Michael Osman will be talking to you about uh, Bluetooth keyboards. Give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thanks, Todd. Thanks, Todd. Can you guys hear me? Excellent. I can hear you too, some of you. Um, it's uh, really uh, a pleasure to be here for Shmoocon VI. Suck it, Emacs. Uh, I'm Mike, and uh, I work at the Institute for Telecommunication Sciences at the United States Department of Commerce Boulder Labs in Colorado. And uh, ITS was really cool, and they sent me here. Uh, and uh, we do uh, telecommunication research and engineering services for various government agencies. Uh, but this work that I'm presenting today is my own. Um, if I say something stupid, when I say something stupid, uh, don't blame the government. I'm here to talk about Bluetooth keyboards, and in particular, devices that follow the Bluetooth HID profile, the Human Interface Device Profile. That was published in 2003. And I'm talking about devices that, that uh, are following the Bluetooth core specification version 1.2. Uh, that might sound a little old to you. Some of you may have heard a few weeks ago that Bluetooth 4.0 was released. Uh, but the reason I'm, talk I'm looking at 1.2 is because that's what keyboards use. Keyboards don't use Bluetooth low energy that was in, uh, specified in 4.0. They don't use alternative Mac 5, 802.11 that was, that was in 3.0. They don't use simple secure pairing that was in 2.1. They don't use enhanced data rate that was 2.0. You have to go back to version 1.2 to find uh, new features of Bluetooth that are actually used by Bluetooth keyboards that are on the market. Uh, incidentally, uh, something else that was published in 2003 as a particular uh, article in an issue of Cryptogram. I'm sure you guys have all heard of Cryptogram, that newsletter that's written by the other Bruce. Um, and uh, and uh, in the 2003, he wrote a little short article on the importance of authentication. And it was so kind of saying, basically, uh, encryption's great and all, but if you, don't, if you don't verify who's on the other end of the line, it's kind of pointless, right? So um, uh, he, I want to read you a little excerpt, oh, and it would be nice if I had this out and ready for you, wouldn't it, uh, from this uh, February 2003 issue. Uh, Last year, I had a conversation with an engineer involved with security for the Bluetooth wireless protocol. I told him that Bluetooth has only privacy and not per packet authentication. He responded with the prototypical lame responses. One, pseudo-random frequency hopping makes it nearly impossible for an attacker to get in. And two, the range is only eight feet, so the attacks are naturally limited. I tried to argue the point, but eventually gave up. Then I said something like, I can hardly wait for Bluetooth to become universal because I really want a wireless keyboard and mouse with a base station built into my computer. He said, he said yes, but you really probably don't want to use Bluetooth for that because then somebody could stuff keystrokes or mouth clicks into your system. Uh, is it really that bad? Uh, can anybody in the parking lot uh, um, sniff your keystrokes, stuff keystrokes into your PC? Uh, the answer is a little bit complicated, and that's why I'm here today. Bluetooth keyboards uh, are generally battery powered and most of them have a power switch. Um, I have seen keyboards that don't have a power switch. Uh, I've seen a keyboard that has a power button for a PC but doesn't actually have a switch to turn, it, turn itself off and on. Uh, Bluetooth keyboards, most of them have a connect button that uh, puts the keyboard into discover, discoverable mode and allows a host to connect to it and, and initiate that communication. Um, Bluetooth keyboards generally have some kind of indicator, like an LED light, or sometimes even a whole uh, LCD display. Um, and uh, that tells you something about what it's doing. Usually, at the very least, they have some kind of indicator to tell you that they're in discoverable mode. Um, and uh, oftentimes, Bluetooth keyboards have uh, their BD8EDR, the Bluetooth device address, printed somewhere on them, or on a sticker, or something like that, which is really convenient if you're uh, you know, trying to connect to these things. Um, and w one particular interesting thing, the Bluetooth keyboards, most of them ship uh, with a 
host adapter in the form of a dongle, a USB dongle. And it's just the same as any other USB dongle you would buy, except that it also has a little connect button on it. Um, and so the idea is you, you, know, you push the connect button on your keyboard, you put your connect button on your dongle, they find each other, and everything starts to work. Um, and that process of connecting to each other is, is establishing what's called a virtual cable. But uh, realize that virtual cabling is different than pairing. You might be familiar with pairing from other Bluetooth devices that you've used uh, where you, it's a, it uses some kind of a pin. And uh, the result of pairing is a, a link key, which is a shared secret uh, between the two devices that can then be used for authentication and encryption down the road. Um, many times when you connect, when you virtually cable to uh, uh, HID devices or a device in a host, uh, many times you are pairing and virtually cabling at the same time, but not necessarily. Uh, the virtual cable concept is that, you know, your keyboard is plugged into a computer, a one-to-one -one correspondence. It's only plugged into one at a time is the idea, right? Just like it would be if you plugged it in with a cable. Um, but it's a different construct than parent. The HID profile, the Bluetooth HID profile, um, basically it's pretty short. It's only about a hundred page specification compared to about 2000 for the core specification for Bluetooth. And, uh, and basically it says what we do is we take USB HID and run it over Bluetooth. So the USB guys have figured out this human interface device stuff. We're just gonna take their uh, you know, their protocol and run it on top of Bluetooth. And one thing that stood out to me in particular is that encryption support is required for keyboards. Uh, it says that right there in the Bluetooth HID profile. And um, it also says that uh, encryption support is not required for a mouse uh, or for most other HID devices. And uh, And keyboards only have to support encryption. They don't actually have to use it all the time. Nowhere in the specification does it say, keystrokes shall be encrypted. The HID protocol is uh, um, in the form of short frames called reports. And an HID report is carried in an L2 cap frame, which is, part of, which is one of the uh, Bluetooth suite uh, protocols. Uh, and that runs over HCI, the host controller interface, between a host and a host adapter, like a dongle. And that same HID report carried in the same L2 cap frame is carried over the baseband, what's called the baseband interface, which is the air interface between a dongle and a device. So if we're wanting to uh, explore these systems, we kind of have two different approaches or two different avenues that we can take. One is the HCI layer and the other is the baseband layer. Um, and the tools that I'm going to be talking about today kind of fit into two categories. Some of them are HCI layer tools that are based on uh, the BlueZ uh, Linux Bluetooth stack. And the other are uh, baseband tools uh, using the, the GR Bluetooth uh, project, GNU Radio, and the USRP uh, from Edis Research. Um, and uh, as many of you know, I'm a developer on the GR Bluetooth project, so I've, I've uh, been doing a lot of work on that. But for this talk, I really have focused a lot on what can be done with off-the-shelf dongles and uh, you know, a $10 part and uh, open source software on the left. Um, I, I'm really interested in what can, attacker, what can an attacker do with those really affordable tools? And I'm also really interested in what can a defender do with those very affordable tools? I mean, maybe you assume that your attacker has a USRP or even more sophisticated hardware, but if you're a defender and you're on a budget, wouldn't it be nice to be able to use the more affordable tools to assess your own systems and figure out where your weaknesses are? Um, the uh, HID uh, protocol basically has two flavors. One's called boot protocol and the other is report pr protocol. And this comes from the USB HID spec, okay? So for wired keyboards. Um, the report protocol is the thing that all keyboards are required to support. Um, and uh, all HID devices are required to support. It's a very flexible protocol where the HID device provides some kind of a, a descriptor to the host that tells the host how to parse their messages. So it's a very flexible and complicated uh, parser. Uh, and it so typically it's only implemented in a, a very full uh, stack implementation on the host side. 
But 